Well, good morning. We are here at the Answers in Genesis headquarters, and I have a really special treat for you today. This is a special treat, and this is the first time that we've actually done this by video conference. We have a creation scientist from the United Kingdom, who's a professor at a secular university. Uh, we have him uh, video conference. He actually invents things. Yes, a creation scientist who invents things. And he's going to be speaking at a conference here uh, in America, in the USA, uh, May 5 and 6, here at the Creation Museum. But he's also going to be speaking in the United Kingdom, in West Bromwich, uh, October 26 to 28, and that's our big mega conference. We've got, already got hundreds of people uh, who have registered for that, and people come from all over Europe, of course, all over the United Kingdom. Uh, so, uh, Professor Stuart Burgess, welcome, Hi. and welcome to our Facebook Live here this morning. And this, this is great that we can do this. We can have you live from England. And here we are, uh, right here in northern Kentucky at the Creation Museum. And we want to talk to you because you're going to be here at the Best of British Bible and Science Conference that we're having May 5 and 6. We're bringing over uh, yourself, Professor Andy McIntosh, uh, also Brian Edwards. Professor Andy McIntosh was a professor at a second university as well. Yeah. And we're bringing you over. Uh, we're doing what's called the Best of British Bible and Science. We have Simon Turpin, who heads up our ministry there in the United Kingdom, our Answers in Genesis ministry, and he's a theologian and mm -hmm. a great speaker and great writer. Uh, and then together with uh, some of us here, we have this special conference coming up. But I, I wanted people to meet you, and I'm, I'm going to encourage as many people here in the USA, if you can come to this conference, May 5 and 6, uh, here. One of the reasons we're doing this is to also videotape uh, these creation scientists from England and uh, our speakers from England. But uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. Pr Professor Burgess, uh, actually, I featured you in a video clip uh, in the Bill Nye debate. Uh, because in the Bill Nye debate, I want to show people that Bill Nye was wrong when he says, if you're a creationist, you can't be a real scientist. And first, I'd like you to, to tell people uh, what you do, uh, you're a professor at a secular university, I'll let, them tell, I'll let you tell them uh, which university, what you do uh, there, and uh, then I want to talk to you about, you had something to do with some satellite, uh, some invention, and then something recently that was really spectacular in regard to the Olympic Games, and uh, some invention that really is, is quite extraordinary. So first of all, uh, welcome, and uh, tell us where you work and, and, and what your position is. Yeah, it's good to speak to you, uh, Ken. Well, I'm a professor of engineering design at Bristol University, and that means I teach and I also research uh, design, actually not just in engineering, but also design in the natural world uh, as well. I look at the design of the human body and the design of birds and trees and other things. And so I have a wonderful privilege of being able to compare design and engineering and also uh, in nature as well. So you're a creationist at a secular university. I mean, you know, Bill Nye over here, Bill Nye the science guy, if people over here will be familiar with him, uh, and other evolutionists say, if you're a, you're a creationist, you can't be a scientist. Uh, do your yeah, colleagues well, say that? <laughs> yeah, I, I do remember the, the, the Bill Nye debate that, that you had, and one of the things that surprised me was he said, he said, if you're a creationist, surely that holds you back in your science, and that's completely wrong. Uh, I think in my experience, my creation beliefs actually help me to be a better designer. One of the reasons is that uh, when I look at the natural world, I have an expectation that it's going to be very sophisticated and very elegant and beautiful. So that inspires me to, to look more closely uh, at, at the natural world. Uh, whereas if I believed in evolution, I wouldn't have that same inspiration. So I strongly disagree with what Bill Nye said in that debate. Now, it's interesting. Uh, Bill Nye said that, uh, but at the same time uh, that he said that, um, I, I don't think he's invented anything quite like you invented. What, what did you invent for a particular satellite? might like to tell people which satellite and what you invented. Yeah, well, actually, I have uh, seven patents and... I believe that when someone invents something, they're using uh, the God-given gift. And I, as 
as we're made in the image of God, I think it's a very natural thing to be an inventor designer. Uh, probably my biggest invention was the double action worm gear set for the biggest Earth observation satellite in the world, which helped to deploy the solar array. And uh, that's that won quite a number of national awards. So that's that's what I call real observational science. So it's run a number of national awards. If that if that gear set hadn't have worked, uh, how much would that have cost people? Uh, well, before the rocket was launched, I was very nervous because the whole satellite cost 1.6 billion uh, pounds, and my gearbox could have been a single point failure. So I was incredibly nervous before <laughs> that rocket uh, was launched, and. I knew that design does not happen by chance, and design is a very difficult uh, thing. And it's like you say, uh, you, you, you hear a lot of these people like Richard Dawkins, who've actually never designed anything and never invented anything, and they have no idea how hard design is. So often they say, well, the world, it could just evolve so easily, but they have no idea how uh, complex design is. So, uh, yeah, R Richard Dawkins, I mean, he's from your part of the world, and yeah. he's that famous atheist that attacks creationists. Yeah, I don't know of any famous invention he's had, and I don't know of many really, uh, you know, heavy scientific papers he's really written that have impacted the world. You've written a number of, of papers. You've had things published, correct? Yeah, I've published over 150 papers. I think Richard Dawkins has published about 33. Um, so it's another myth that creationists don't publish papers. Uh, creationists like Andy McIntosh, Steve Taylor, myself, between us, we've published, I think, over 500 scientific papers. So you have a number of these myths that are just, that are just not true. Wow. And uh, recently uh, you uh, were actually in the news uh, because of another invention that had something to do with the Olympic Games recently. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, the last two years, uh, probably the best project I've ever had in my life. The last two years I've been working for the British Olympic cycling team, uh, doing design work and also a lot of testing on their bicycles. And it was just so exciting uh, to be a part of the Rio Olympics. Uh, it, it was not just exciting. I wasn't quite sure what would happen, but uh, it was just so thrilling at the Rio Olympics. Uh, team GB won six gold medals. Uh, which was an incredible number just for one uh, event. And to be part of that was just so exciting, to be part of that engineering. So, yeah, that, that was really good. So, so, so what part did you sort of engineer? What really made the difference? I worked on the transmission, so the chain and the chain wheels. And actually, I'm going to be discussing some of that when I come across in May. So that's one of the case studies uh, and hopefully that will be very exciting, that, that part of the talk. But in cycling, sometimes the difference between first and second can be just a split second. Uh, so if you can just reduce the mass of parts like chains and chain wheels just by, time, just by a few grams, it can make the difference between gold and silver. So doing that design work and testing was critical to the success of the team. And are you going to go on with that? Is it being used in other places now? Uh, I'm, I'm already, I've got another contract. I'm doing more design and testing now for the Tokyo Olympics. So that is absolutely uh, continuing. One of the reasons it's been so thrilling is, as I said before, often I like to compare design and engineering in nature. And recently I was looking at the friction levels in the human knee joint. And I was uh, staggered to find that the friction in the knee joint is less than one hundredth of that in an Olympic bicycle chain, which was very humbling because I've been working so long to reduce the friction levels in the bicycle chain and to see that it is so superior in the human body. It's often the case that when you compare design in the natural world and design and engineering, it's very humbling for a designer. You know, that, that is really something when you think about it, because there are these secularists, Richard Dawkins, Bill Nye over here, for instance, would look at uh, the human body and say, well, that just arose by natural processes. You know, there's no, you know, there was no creator involved. And yet, look at all the work that you and others uh, 
intelligent people hours and hours put into design in regard to the the bicycle chain and you can't get it as good as what God's designed. <laughs> exactly and so many of my colleagues consider the human body as the gold standard of design. You can't improve on it and that's why uh, things like bioinspiration are so important today. Designers are trying to be inspired by the brilliant design that we see in the human body and other areas of creation. I mean, what do you think it would affect people's, uh, you know, creativity and inventiveness when they look at, say, the human body and look at life and say, ah, oh, just all arose by chance, random processes, rather than you looking and saying, I know that an infinite designer created this, so I'm going to look at that design. I think that's a really good point, Ken, because if I believed in evolution, I would not have bothered to look in the knee joint, because I would have thought there's going to be nothing sophisticated in there. And I think Andy McIntosh would say the same. If, if he believed in evolution, he would not have bothered to look at the Bombardier Beetle, because he wouldn't have been expecting anything clever. So uh, I, I'm absolutely sure that, that, uh, so that science would be progressing better if people knew the truth of Genesis and knew the truth of God as creator. Well, here's Richard Dawkins out there, and Richard Dawkins is attacking people like yourself, attacks creationists and mocks at us. Uh, but again, I don't see any famous invention that he has made. And of course, he has the whole wrong foundation, so he's got the wrong worldview, and it basically comes down to a spiritual battle with him, doesn't it? Yeah, I think this whole business of worldviews is so important. That's why I think... Uh, AIG do such a good job of explaining to people that there are these two worldviews, one worldview with God and one worldview without God. But sadly, in the media, or so often put it across that it's faith versus science, but that is such, uh, that's such a lie. That's, that's just not true at all. Now, there's been a number of uh, news reports over here recently, uh, you know, talking about this religion versus science and faith versus science. And in fact, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, is coming up with this series on Netflix. It's being released soon and a documentary. And basically, he's just an actor. You know, he calls himself Bill Nye, the science guy. He's just an actor and he gets up there and he does all this acting and things and so on and uh, gets on TV, of course, mocks people like us and rejects what we believe. But uh, we're not having Bill Nye speak here. Not that he would want to speak. Well, he would want to try to convince people everything happened by chance, random processes. We're bringing a real scientist. You're a real scientist who has actually invented things. And because of your worldview, it's enabled you to excel in these inventions and even be written up in the secular media. What do your colleagues think about your inventions and your worldview, how that goes together? Well, what's interesting, Ken, is that uh, I'm surprised in my university, I'm surprised how many of my colleagues are actually sympathetic to intelligent design or even creationism. I think the media do not give a fair reflection of what academics think. I think one of the reasons for that is that so many atheists shout very loud and the media just listen to those who are shouting the loudest. I think there's a quiet majority of academics who are actually very sympathetic my engineering colleagues are very sympathetic to me because they know that design does not happen by chance. My biggest surprise is how many of my biology colleagues who aren't even Christians who are actually sympathetic to what I believe, but they won't come, they won't acknowledge that to the media because they know their job's at stake. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I, I know it's the same over here. Uh, as it is there, I'm sure, and that is, uh, even if the silent majority are sympathetic uh, towards uh, your worldview and what you do, they know if they say anything publicly, then there's a minority of secularists, of atheists, who will then blast that through the media and attack and scoff and mock and call you anti-science and, and so on. Uh, and, and, and the same is happening over here in politics in all sorts of areas. But Hey, uh, Dr. Burgess, you're going to be over here uh, in America May 5 and 6, along with Dr. Andy McIntosh, along with Simon Turpin, and along with Brian Edwards. Uh, why don't you tell people a little bit about Brian, too? Yeah, Brian Edwards, uh, he's one of the leading theologians in the United Kingdom, and he's done some amazing work looking at the archaeological evidence uh, for the Bible, showing 
it, there's amazing evidence showing that the, the Bible events did really happen. There's been a lot of scrutiny, but in every case, the archaeological evidence supports Bible history and what the Bible teaches. And that just shows we can have confidence in the book of Genesis. Now, hasn't he written and been a part of a, a, a guide to archaeology through the British Museum? Yeah, that's really excellent. And uh, if you ever come to London, which I would recommend, uh, it's good to, to visit some of the great museums. And uh, visiting the, the British Museum is so much better if you, if you have Brian's guide. It's really helpful. And uh, it's good because, of course, he presents the biblical worldview. Now, I know the British Museum used to sell his guide. Do they still sell the guide there? I, I'm not sure if they still are. I, I do hope they are doing that because it's a high-quality publication. It, it is. I know when I went there, I was able to get that guide, and it's, it's uh, basically a, a Christian guide to the British Museum. It's absolutely fascinating. And so Brian Edwards will be over here along with you, along with uh, Professor Andy McIntosh. Maybe tell people a little bit, little bit about uh, Andy. I've known Andy uh, along with you for many, many years now because he was a professor too and, and very good at what he did and uh, uh, he was applauded for the work he did too. Yeah, Andy McIntosh, uh, like myself, he's working at the cutting edge of scientific advancement and he's done some amazing work on the Bombardier Beetle and I, I know he's going to be talking about that uh, in May. He's, he's published several papers and has some patents on work inspired by the Bombardier Beetle. He's he shows how there's incredibly intricate design in the way that that Bombardier Beetle uh, fires out those explosive gases. And yeah, he's, he's a highly respected scientist in the UK and yeah, so, he's got some great stuff to present. So he was a professor. What was he a professor of? He was a professor of thermodynamics uh, at Leeds University. Thermodynamics is, is one of the most important subjects in engineering, it's to do with uh, the creation of matter and and energy. So he's worked in, in a really important area in, in science. And so it's interesting, both of you uh, published many, many papers, and you've got these inventions, you both got patents, you're both uh, well-known scientists, and you're both creationists, and you're both were professors at secular universities, and you still are a professor at, the, at a secular university. Yes, yeah. Um, so this is uh, May 5 and 6 when you and Dr. Andy McIntosh and also Brian Edwards and Simon Turpin. Simon heads up our Answers in Genesis ministry there in the United Kingdom and he also uh, is a theologian. Yeah, I'm glad he's coming because, well, I think it's good having two theologians and two scientists. Uh, and I know Simon's going to be talking about Adam, the first Adam and the last Adam. And I think it's so important that people see the importance that Adam was a real historical figure. It's great that AIG had this book out, uh, Adam, and I think that's going to really complement the talks that Andy McIntosh and myself will give. So if you want to meet some real scientists, and we have a number here at Answers in Genesis anyway, but these are real scientists from England who are well published, uh, inventions, patents, uh, fascinating and I just love to hear Dr. Stuart Burgess and Dr. Andy McIntosh speak, uh, Brian Edwards and, and Simon Turpin uh, coming over with them, that's May 5 and 6. Now if you look at uh, the comments we pinned right at the top there a link to the Best of British Bible and Science Conference here at the Creation Museum May 5 and 6, go and have a look at that and uh, Dr. Andy McIntosh and Dr. Stuart Burgess and also Simon and myself and Dr. Danny Faulkner and others, Paul Garner uh, others will be at our mega conference in the United Kingdom at West Bromwich, October 26 through 28. We've already got hundreds of registrations for that. It's going to be a big conference. Um, people come from all over Europe to that. Uh, so people can uh, also look in the comments. We'll have a link to that or go to the Answers in Genesis, uh, org, uh website. Uh, we'll just see, uh, Dr. Burgess, before we let you go here, um, I'll just ask our videographer, are you able to see any of the comments? I know we've got this set up a little differently. And maybe if anyone wants to ask you a question, i put you on the spot here, I didn't warn you about this, but if we've got any questions, we can see if there's uh, any there. And, uh, I haven't seen any questions. A lot of people appreciate uh, 
a lot of comments uh, about how much they appreciate this. We didn't tell them ahead of time they could ask questions, but uh, we'll just uh, delay a little bit here to give people opportunity. If you want to ask a question of Dr. Stuart Burgess from England right now, uh, you can ask that question and then I'll, we'll get uh, an answer from him. Uh, so uh, again, the Bettista British Bible and Science, May 5 to 6 this year here at the Creation Museum. And for those who come, they get a two-day admission to the Creation Museum, a one-day admission to the Ark Encounter, and they get 20% off admission for their uh, immediate family members to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter as well and also get a discount off all of our resources uh, so they get some special offers uh, here and uh, then to also encourage you to look at the UK creation mega conference over there in the United Kingdom it's going to be a unique conference uh, and uh, people are already registering for that uh, Dr Burgess will be there Dr Andy McIntosh will be there uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner from here. I'll be over there as well. Simon Turpin, our head of our ministry uh, in England, will be over there, and he is a, a theologian. And we have others, Paul Garner, Dr. Stephen uh, Lloyd, uh, John Mackay, uh, Dr. Bodie Bochum. Uh, many Americans will be very, very familiar with him. Uh, so any questions? Yeah, the first question is, how old do you believe the Earth to be? Okay, so... Putting you on the spot now, here you are, professor at a second university, uh, a scientist, and they're asking you, how old do you believe the Earth to be? Yeah, I believe the Earth is uh, approximately 6,000 years old. The reason I believe that is because uh, Genesis gives history. You can see that through the genealogies. And I don't have any problem uh, with that uh, at all. I don't think it's uh, against the scientific evidence. Um, as an engineer, um, sometimes I'm asked to uh, design things and produce things that, that have maturity. For example, car engines, uh, now they're produced to be mature engines that can drive fast straight away. So I have no, no difficulty at all seeing God creating a mature creation 6,000 years ago. So how common is the young earth view in the UK? How common is the young earth view in the UK? I, I, I would say, okay, uh, how common, say, in the secular world, <laughs> how common in the Christian world? What, what would your answer be to that? Well, of course, in the secular world, it's not common at all because people uh, just accept what, what they're, they're taught. Most people haven't really thought it through. They just accept what, what the media say and, and what the education systems say. Amongst Christians, I find a lot of Christians haven't really thought it through. And they say, well, they assume it's millions of years old, but they haven't really thought about uh, well, what they're saying. And if I discuss the age of the earth with them, uh, often they're quite open to, to changing their view. So amongst Christians, it may not be that common, the young earth view, but I find that the Christians haven't really thought about it deeply. Okay, any others uh, there, Maria? What would you suggest for uh, people to do to help college students? Because I know that, that that's a difficult one for you know Christian college students attending secular institutions. What's your advice for them? Uh, one of the things they can do is to invite uh, good speakers to their Christian union. Uh, just in the next couple of weeks, I'm giving a, a couple of talks uh, in, in colleges. Um, I think CUs in this country do a great uh, work and witness, and I'm sure that's true uh, in the United States uh, as well. But telling their student friends about good websites like the AIG website, uh, I think those things are really important. Obviously, it's important to be patient in, in a secular uh, setting, but yeah, really supporting Christian unions is important, I think. Well, you know, um, over here in America, we're seeing an, an increasing instance of, we've seen this in politics, and I've actually seen it happening in the Christian a a arena too, that if you have a conservative Christian coming to speak at a secular university, there's actually moves by those who disagree with the position to stop them coming. Uh, do you see that sort of persecution over there in England, in the United Kingdom? Yeah, and usually I think that might be one of those things that starts in the United States and then comes to Britain normally. We normally export uh, negative things over to the, to the USA. 
But what's really strange, isn't it, that science should be open-minded. So it's a very strange thing when views are not allowed to be uh, put forward. Science is meant to be um, open. Uh, so it's a very sad thing if people are not allowed to, 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 to speak openly. Okay, uh, we got some other questions there. We could keep you here all day, you know. We better not do that. You've probably got uh, lectures you have to give today. Get back to the university. Why do you believe some Christians hold to a theory that the earth is millions of years old? Why do you think there are Christians who hold to the idea of millions of years? I, I can see the temptation that they believe, I think wrongly, uh, that there's a lot of evidence that the earth is very old. People don't like to contradict scientists. The scientists are are assumed to be uh, holders of things that are true and so people feel awkward about going against what scientists believe in but I think that's a mistake to do that because it's so important to see that there are these two world views um, it's not true that scientists are just influenced by the facts they are so influenced by their world view do you and it's important that Christians can see that just as a question for me, do you think the average person who believes in millions of years or just accepts it, whether Christian or non-Christian, really understand the dating methods and the assumptions behind them and how fallible they are? I don't think they, they believe it at all. And um, some of my engineering colleagues uh, who do think about these things, I think they have difficulty with an old earth because engineering systems are so delicate that it's very hard to see how the earth ecosystem could last more than several of tens of thousands of years because it's so delicate. Uh, how could it just keep going for millions of years? But I think most people just don't think it through. Don't th and most people, if you ask them which dating method, they wouldn't even know, would they? Or how does a dating method work? I, I find over here, most wouldn't have a clue. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I don't know whether you want to deal with that one not being an astronomer. Dr. Danny Fulton deals with that one. Did you want to have a go at the starlight question? Yeah, well, one thing I would recommend is to buy Danny Faulkner's great book on the cosmos because I think that gives one of the best explanations of starlight. And I said earlier, you, you have to accept to some extent that God created a mature creation. Mm -hmm. I think the key thing is to have a high view of God that God can do anything. God could create the universe in an instant. Uh, it was very easy for God to create uh, the world in, in six days. I think the key thing is to have a high view of God. But I would recommend to look at Danny's book to, 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 to see the details of that. The other thing I always like to remind people, uh, Stuart, is the fact that, you know, when they say, oh, but doesn't it take like millions of years to get them the further a star? But, but the, the people who believe in the Big Bang and the secular view of uh, the origin of the universe have, have a problem too because they don't have enough time to get light through the whole universe on that basis and they can only get it halfway. And, that, you know, the point is whether you're a secularist who believes in the Big Bang or whether you're a Christian believing in six literal days, uh, you know, th th that issue in regard to light from the furthest star involves all sorts of assumptions and so on. But secularists have problems in regard to that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and of course, uh, people who believe in the Big Bang have even bigger problems because they have to explain where anything came from in the very first place. And I've never heard a good answer to that. So, Ken, can you tell people where they can go to find um, if there's other conferences in the UK? Um, yeah, if, if for other conferences, we have uh, our speaker over there, Simon Turpin. I, Andy speaks a lot. You speak a lot too. Yeah. Um, so they could go to our answersingenesis.org website. We have an Answers in Genesis yeah. UK uh, website. Um, and where else could they find out about where you're speaking, where Andy's speaking? And well, I, as you say, the best thing is to go to the Answers in Genesis UK website. I, that's updated very often. That's really the, the best place. But also, they can look in various newspapers like Evangelicals Now and Evangelicals Times. Uh, that, that, that also gives a good summary. So again, uh, you'll be over here May 5 and 6. Look forward to seeing you here. The best of uh, British Bible and science. And uh, you and Dr. Andrew McIntosh, Simon Turpin, Brian Edwards, two theologians, two scientists. Uh, people can meet a real creation uh, scientist. You've
published uh, all sorts of papers. I think you said, what, 150 papers uh, yes. compared to Richard Dawkins' 33 or something like that. Right. Yes. And you've got patents. I wonder how many patents Richard Dawkins has. I haven't heard of any. Uh, I don't think and, there's any. And, and uh, you, you've got a couple of famous inventions, the one with the uh, bicycles for the Olympic Games and the gear set for the, for the satellite. Uh, so I, 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 would, I really want people, I want young people to know. And I would encourage parents to even send their young people, their teenagers, to this conference here at Answers and Genesis at the Creation Museum, May 5 and 6. They need to see people like Dr. Burgess. He's a professor at a secular university, yet he's a creationist, and he has invented some incredible things, and he's written all sorts of papers, published all sorts of papers, uh, and uh, I just uh, really praise the Lord for people like you and who are prepared to stand. Uh, does it worry you standing out as a Christian, as a six-day creationist uh, in such a secularized culture? I mean, uh, d d does that concern you in any way? Uh, it does cause problems occasionally. A lot of atheists write to my university uh, asking uh, for me to be dealt with. But I'm very grateful to my university for ignoring uh, th those attacks. Um, so, yeah, at times it has been a little bit difficult, but I feel it's important to stand up for what's right. So you mean you have atheists who are intolerant of other views in, in England, like we have atheists in America who are totally intolerant of others? That, that's, that's absolutely the case. <laughs> yeah. We find over here the people that claim we're intolerant are the most intolerant of all. <laughs> exactly, yes. We find that all the time. Well, we could talk for ages here. Any other burning questions, Maria? Lots of comments. Uh, Dr. Burgess will uh, hang up here in a moment. When we do that, if you just stay on the line so I can just chat to okay. you after we hang up here. But uh, uh, the breadth of British Bible and Science, May 5 and 6, here at Answers in Genesis at the Creation Museum. Uh, you can have a look at the comments and uh, the top comment that's there, that's pinned there. You better go direct uh, to the link there. And then in the United Kingdom, uh, this year, in West Bromwich, in West Midlands, uh, October 26 through 28, we have a mega conference. We have a, a number of speakers that are going to be at that. And the, I'm going over to uh, the United Kingdom. So instead of you coming here, we're going over to you. Uh, be myself and Dr. Danny Faulkner, my brother Steve Ham. We also have Paul Garner, Dr. Stephen Lloyd. Uh, just very quickly, Paul Garner, Dr. Stephen Lloyd. Tell us about them. Yeah, Paul Garner has done excellent work on rocks and, and fossils. Uh, he, he's done some really, and he's well qualified in that uh, area as, as well. And Steve Lloyd, he's more of a theologian, uh, like Brian Edwards, and he's written some very good articles explaining the weakness of theistic evolution. Uh, so, yeah, that's two great additions to that conference. And, you know, the whole idea of theistic evolution, adding evolution to the Bible, that God supposedly used evolution, really, in a way, uh, that came from England and spread around the world. I do apologize for that. <laughs> and, and, of course, you're the country that, that gave rise to Darwin, right? He was born there in Shrewsbury. Actually, um, this coming Sunday, the 12th of February, uh, is Darwin's birthday. He was yes. born in 1809, and over here in America, uh, there's an atheist, Michael Zimmerman, who started this idea of Evolution Sunday, they now call it Evolution Weekend, where an atheist has tried to get churches to celebrate Darwin, uh, and they call it Darwin Day, and it's this coming Sunday on the 12th of February. So this coming Sunday, 12th of February, I encourage churches uh, to really celebrate our Creator God. Uh, yeah. as, they, as they talk to people, uh, because Darwin really popularized a philosophy that has spread around the world and has really done so much to undermine the authority of the Word of God. Yeah, exactly. And, and to me, a picture of what Darwin has done is the fact that he's buried in Westminster Abbey in the floor of the church. I've been there, mm -hmm. I've seen his grave, and really a philosophy that undermines the foundation of the church, if you like, uh, uh, is, is, there he is buried in the foundation uh, of the church. That's sort of my picture about uh, Darwin. Well, um, uh, Dr. Burgess, uh, thank you for joining us. 
and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit after we uh, uh, close off our Facebook Live here. We look forward to seeing you over here, May 5 and 6, and then I look forward to seeing you over in uh, England uh, later in the year. And thank you for the stand you take. And I know uh, your students would see the same excellence in their classes as, uh, as we see uh, in everything that you do. Thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, Ken. Okay, we're signing off here for this Facebook Live. It's this afternoon, 2.30. Our Answers News with myself, Bodie Hodge, and Dr. Georgia Purden. We do that every Monday and Thursday live, uh, Eastern Standard Time, 2.30 uh, this afternoon.